This is a sound check. Yeah, I hear. You can hear me in the in the earphone. Yes.
Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and start. And I'm starting with, uh, this is Gregor here, and Dina is here helping me. And so far this morning, I shouldn't say this, there are no technical problems. Who knows how long that will last. Um, and we're starting through the questions on the um, posted to the forum. And I'm going to start with a request to actually work through the insert, insure question problem. A lot of people had questions about the insure question problem. So I'm going to try to combine several, um, I'm going to try to combine several threads into, into one working through of that problem. So let me get the starter for it. And I'll open it up here in Racket. And there it is. So I'm supposed to, um, I've made the font a little bigger for you all to see. So that's why the question box isn't fitting. But I'm supposed to use the HDF recipe to design a function that consumes a string and adds question mark to the end unless the string already ends in question mark. So let's see. It's consuming a string. Design a function that consumes a string and it's going to produce a string. It's going to add a question mark to the string and it doesn't explicitly say return it but that's how I'm inferring that. It's going to produce the string with the question mark at the end. So I make my stop. some string. Okay, there have been a lot of questions about this. There always are a lot of questions about this. The stub has to return some string. One way to think about the stub is that if you're thinking about the stub for more than about 10 or 15 seconds, you're thinking about something other than the stub. The stub really should be very, very simple. When I have a stub that has to return string, I just make it return the empty string. We'll see a little bit later in the course that there are times where you make a more elaborate stub than that, but for now that stub is fine. Now let's do the check expects. Check expects. So have a string that doesn't end in question mark. Thing here, what I'm going to do is I've got to decide what to put there. If I look at the signature, it tells me that one thing to put there is it has to be a string. And if I look at the purpose, it tells me that there's at least two cases, one when it doesn't end in a string and one when it does. So I don't know. That doesn't end in a string in a question mark. And here's one. It's back on now. And we're not going to add a system. It's clipping. Hang on, the audio is clipping out. Oh, now I see what is happening. Uh, There's no way to deal with that, is there? No, it's really easy. Sorry, the audio has cut out a couple times, and we're aware of that. Um, Hangouts on Air has this wonderful feature where if it thinks you're typing, it doesn't, um, it turns the mic off. But apparently it learns not to do that after a while. So, Dina hopes and prays that it's going to stop doing that. So anyways, here's the stub. And I'm going to... Oh, you, you know what we'll do here? We'll take advantage of this opportunity to talk about another question. So I've got an error here. And one of the things about dealing with errors like this is, is to really stop and actually read the message carefully. It says it was expecting a closing 
And then these, these quotes here are just around the thing that it really wanted. So it wanted to see a closing double quote. And right here it was highlighting it for me. Let me run it again so the highlighting and it's highlighting right here. And the problem here is possible new line within a string suggests a missing string quote on line 9, which is right here. And it's basically saying, hey, you know, maybe there should have been a close quote there. And in fact, there should have been. And in fact, it should have been. And there it is. So let me run it again. Both, both of those tests are well formed. Now, let's keep going. So there's two cases. There's a case where it ends in a question mark and a case where it doesn't. And now I've got to figure that out. In one of the functions that we already saw to use was substring. So here's a thing that you could do, which is you can kind of do some scratch work. And you could do the scratch work. You can do the scratch work either right here in the interactions window, in the uh, definitions window, it doesn't let me. If you just type for a minute and then I'll turn it off while you're typing. OK, hang on one second. I'm going to just hang on. It out. You've turned the mouse upside down. <laughs> OK, we're back. So I can either do the experiment right here, or sometimes you might do the interaction area. There's a function called substring we know about. It's, it's, it's happening again. Is a function called substring we know about. And if I give substring a string like y, now substring needs two more arguments, where to start and where to end. But let's say I forget that string. And what it tells me is it says the expected number of arguments does not match the given number expected to, to 3, which means substrings can either take two arguments or three arguments. Well, the second argument to substring is where to start. So if I give it 2, let's give it 1. I'll give it 1, and I won't give it a third argument. I don't know what's going on here. I'm just experimenting. These tests keep running. What I'm going to do is temporarily comment them out so they'll stop running. Huh. When I call substring with 1, which means to start at the h, and no third argument, it goes all the way to the end. And in fact, that's what substring does. If you don't give it the stop argument, it goes all the way to the end. So now the question is, how do I get substring to give me the last character? Well, in this case, it would be 2, right? And why is it 2? Well, let's see. The string is 3 long. I could do it. Would it be in that case? Well, let me just experiment and guess that it's, it's 4. Is that going to be right? Yeah, that's right. Now, why is the one two and the other one's four? Oh, I think I know. It's because this string is actually three long, and we want to 
setting up an experiment here. Oh yeah, that's right. I want one less than the length of the string. How do I get the length of the string? Well, I could go look in the help desk now under substring and scroll around looking for something that has length in it. I'm not going to actually do it just to save a little time now, but there is in fact a thing called string length. Oh, right. Yeah, this is working. Now I've got this figured out. Now I know how to do this thing. So now So now when I go to the template, which is dot, which is dot, 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 s, I kind of have a plan here. And the plan is, let me copy the template. It's going to be the starting one before. Uh oh. I can't see your tests. Oh, you can't see my tests. Now you can see them. Oh, right. I haven't done the right thing here. I'm just asking the question. I forgot the whole if. I need to say if that thing, that's the last character. If the last character we're not going to add anything to this string. We'll just make then we're not going to add anything to this string. We'll just make s. But if the last character isn't a question, but if the last character, Mark. I didn't hear that if the last character isn't a question mark, then we're going to add a question mark to it. Then we're going to add a question mark to it. One of my tests is failing. Actual value y differed from y. Now, if I click here, it'll take me to the test. Oh, right. The test is wrong. Both tests. Now, look. That function actually took a fair amount of work. You had to figure out substring. You had to figure out the string equals. You had to figure out what you wanted to do. This function took a lot of work. There are really two points I want to make here. Three. One is it took work. Two is setting up good examples of both cases helps a lot. And the third is experimenting helps a lot. Okay. Remember what I said earlier in the course, racket isn't fragile. Okay. If you think the function you want is substring, but you don't know how the arguments to it work, just try it. Just try it. If you do something that's wrong, hi, you get an error, okay? But, but nothing will be broken. So programmers spend a lot of time just trying things, figuring out how to work, especially when you're trying to call some primitive function. 
So I think that's all I'll say about insure question. Does anybody, have we got any? I guess what's the whole Let me see what I've got here. That's true. Um, I'm going back to the online office hours. Where to find more practice problems? That's a question that people have posted. Actually, there's been a couple threads about that in the forums. So, you know, you can always search in the forums for answers to things like that. We've posted a fair number of practice problems at this point. When I go to the all problems link here, which I know you can't see, but in a second I'm going to make it so you can see it, hopefully without hanging up on everyone. When I go here to the all problems link on the website, I get this whole list of problems um, sorted initially by week. And so for week two, um, you know, we have some lecture problems, we have three practice problems, and hmm, where did the week two homework problems go? Oh, there they are at the top. We can try to, we'll try to add some more practice problems. Um, uh, we'll always keep trying to add practice problems. One of the suggestions I made on the um, forums was that if people want to go to the course wiki, and create your own practice problems, um, you know, we'll, and then post a note to the forums, we'll look at them there to make sure we like the way they look. So let me go back now to, um, to the forums and see what we want to talk about next. I don't find it in here. Hang on a second. Dean is trying to ask me a question, and I'm not understanding it. Um, so I'm going to go back to the forums, and she's going to find the, find the question. Um, I want to go to online office hours. I want to go here. We talked about that a bit already. Well, so Maria's got a follow-up to the question. Um, there's not enough detail in your in your question here, Maria, for me to understand exactly what you're saying. Um, the way to, the, the, let's go. Let me go back to the problem that I had, the solution I had just a second ago. I'll have to do a switch on you. Hang on. Once I, once I got to here, once I have this signature, this purpose, and these check expects, I really can't produce a Boolean. I, I've got to produce a string that looks like this. Now, one thing that sometimes happens, and this came up in, an early, in a forum post this morning, actually, is you might interpret the problem somewhat differently and come up with a slightly different purpose and different check expects. And in that case, you know, what we would want you to do is for the rest of the design to conform to those. And then maybe you didn't design exactly the function that we had in mind, but you've got a coherent, solid design. And, you know, that, that just happens. One of the reasons why this method does examples first is that, is that one of the hardest parts about designing programs is actually figuring out what you want. And one of the reasons why a lot of the industry has, over the last 10 years, moved to what's called agile methods is that, is that oftentimes you think you know what the customer wants, and you're not actually right. And, and so what's happened is the, the time, the interaction time between the developer and the customer has gotten much, much shorter. So the developers can kind of prototype things, show that to prospective customers, see what the customers think, 
and then revise. Um, because if you kind of go off on your own for three years and build something, yeah, you run a risk of coming back with not what the market wanted. Uh, so, so there always is this, this issue of, of figuring out exactly what's wanted and part of what the examples first is trying to do is trying to help you figure that out. Now Dean has got a question for me. Is that in? So here's another question I'm going to go back to. What thread is that in? Okay, I'm going to go back to another question about insure question, and then this will be the last question about insure question. I'm going to switch again. So I'm going to W2H2. I wouldn't normally talk about a homework problem here, but I already have for this problem, and also it's a week two problem where we pre-gave you the solutions. So the question here is that the problem statement says assume string has, assume string is a word, so it has length greater than zero. And Muhammad's asking, well, I don't see a test where it has, where it's the empty string. And so I, what we have to clarify there is what we mean when we say you can assume something. When we say you can assume something, it means you don't have to test it. Whoops, I'm going back to the other window. Hang on, I'm switching you now. When we say you can assume something, it means that you can assume it. You don't have to test it. So, for example, you don't have to have a test like this. Because once we say you can you can assume it. What you might want to do like that, we'll talk about this a bit later in the course, but you could start doing it now if you wanted to, is to say assume S has assume S has length greater than zero. assume all uppercase. Okay, I'm not going to do any more on insure question now. I'm switching back to the forms. Uh, maybe I'll just look there and I won't switch you. Maybe I can just quickly grab a question out of there because I think I remember another one I wanted to look at. Uh, Give me one second here, please. A couple of people have asked about the exam and the, the schedule around the end of the term. Um, let me just, we're still finalizing end of term schedule. But it's going to be like you'll have something like 1.5 the eight and to do final. And then two two weeks to do the final. Okay, so the real course will last ten weeks.
Um, that way you'll have a little extra time. Um, two weeks. Two weeks to finish the project in the final. Okay, but this is, you know, it's this is what it, you've turned it about, so, yeah. It's going to be analyzed. Okay, it'll be something like that. It's not yet completely finalized. All right, let me go back to the forums and look for some more questions. Hang on a second. Give me just a second. I'm getting the next the next question. That one. Uh, okay. Another question that Dina has just handed me has to do with when to use a question mark in a program. In the language that we're using in BSL and its related languages, the convention for function names is that if the function is a predicate, so if is that predicates are functions that return Boolean answer, answers. Okay, so predicates the the name of predicates. The name of predicates ends in question mark. So, for example, some names like tall, if you have a function that tells you whether an image is tall, would end in a question mark. If you have a function that tells you whether an image is wide, it would end in a question mark. Um, that's, if you notice, for example, rackets primitive equal. String equals tells you whether two strings are equal to each other. It ends in a question mark. They didn't. These don't work that way, okay? Because consistency is, you know, consistency is good, but over consistency is a bit too much. So. So these are named like that. But all other predicates, so the primitive arithmetic predicates have their, their short names, but all other predicates end in a question mark. Oh, there were some messages that went by about where to put the check expect. Okay. So here was the question. The question is where to put the check expects. And in general, there have been some questions about the order of the elements of the recipe. Let me go back here. You know, in some sense, the order of all these things is a little bit arbitrary. But remember the thing I said in last week's office hours about communities. If you do it consistently, then everybody in the community knows where to look for it. And that's the most important thing about your code, is that it be easy for other people to read. And that's the single most important thing about programs, is that they be easy for other people to read. So signature goes first, because it tells us one very general thing about the function. Purpose goes next, because it tells us the next most specific thing. In 
in BSL, the check expects go here. Okay, and the reason they go there in BSL is because they're also examples. When you start writing larger programs and your unit tests become more complicated, they don't, they actually almost always end up in a separate file because they're just too cumbersome to put right with the definitions. Um, but just in BSL, just for right now, they go here before the function. The reason the stub and the template and the function definition all go together is that they're three versions of the same thing, the function definition. And by week five or six, by week six, you won't actually be leaving these two things behind. It'll just look like that. And of course, you wouldn't have this stuff down here. It would just look like that. So if you were following this recipe in another language, your programs would actually probably look like that with the tests over in some other file. So that's what I have to say about how things are ordered. You have another one, Dina? Hang on, we're getting the next question. Okay, I've done this one. Uh, okay, now we're getting questions off of the Yahoo questions. Yeah, off the YouTube questions, I keep, I don't know, sorry. One of the questions on the YouTube questions is, you know, the course is not a full semester. Would I say that it's watered down? Um, you know, what I would say is that it's not a full semester. We're not going to, in these eight weeks, cover what we cover at UBC in 12 weeks. Uh, we're just not going to do that. Um, uh, so I would say that it's about two-thirds of a semester because eight weeks is about two-thirds of 12 weeks. Um, when we do part two, which again, we don't know exactly when that's going to be, um, then it will be, um, you know, then it, it will cover all or very nearly all of the course. Um, we, um, you know, one of the great things about this whole MOOC space that everybody's trying to figure out is what's the difference between the MOOC version of a course and the at university version of the course. One of the differences clearly is, you know, we have three hours of lab a week that's staffed by TAs, so you kind of have that extra assistance. Um, but right now you're getting pretty much the same eight first weeks that, that we get here. Uh, it's really a little bit closer to the seven weeks because we slowed week one down a little bit here because we didn't have all that TA support for people just starting out. So no, I wouldn't say it's watered down. I would just say that it's shortened. Another question, Dina, in that whole list? Okay, let me look for another question the forums. Okay, so there's a very good question about called errors handling. Let me copy the question up here so everybody will see it. And, you know, the question is, what are we going to do about error handling? And, you know, what this question is asking is, among other things, going back to insure a question, you know, what should insure a question worry about the case where somebody says something? You're not supposed to say that because it says here that it consumes a string. One of the positions we've taken in this course is that you can count on the signature being respected.
So it was better. So, yeah, that's working. Right, so I switch it to you, right? Yeah, we're almost there. Almost there. I keep turning the mouse upside down. No, I don't. Probably will do it. Okay. Okay, we think that now you can hear me. Okay, where was I? Oh, right. I was talking about this error thing. So here's the rule that we're going to give you. If you believe, if you have a well-formed signature, you can count on uh, all callers being legal. And that would just you can hear it. Um, so you can count on this never happening. 
You can count on this never happening. So what that means is that for this course, you're not going to have to enforce those kinds of checks. Okay? This course, you don't have to um, um, do that kind of defensive programming where you protect yourself against functions being called with bad arguments. It's a simplification we made in the course. We make it in the UBC version of the course, too. We start dealing with that just at the end. So that's that question. Let me go back to the forms and find the next question. Yes? Oh, you, you have to use it. I haven't used it. How about now? How about now? Yeah. Okay, you can hear. Not that many. <laughs> um, why not? So it gives you If you just stuck these in your ear, you would know that we were doing it. But then you would be able to tell. Bubba? We were hearing it before. Oh, wait, it's fine. Okay. It's good. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, just looking for the next question. You know, we made it about 40 minutes before we had the first technical problems today, so that's better. Okay, there's a question on the forum about practical application of the HDDF recipe. And the key part of this question had to do with functions that do not return a value but produce results such as writing a file. I'm only going to spend about two minutes on this question because this is a getting ahead question. Um, and I, I want to limit the amount of office hours time I spend on getting ahead questions. Uh, but what I said in the forum is this is a very good question. Okay. These kinds of functions are called effectful. Audio is too quiet. Audio is too quiet. Audio is too quiet. How do we fix that? Oh, we're not using this mic. Uh, I know, we're using this computer mic. Got it. Turn it up over there. <laughs> this is working again. Well, let's not count on that. Wait, I thought it was off. I'm going to mute my mic. Um, OK. These kinds of functions are called effectful, which means they work by, by doing something instead of producing a value. And you can adapt unit testing to work with effectful functions. Um, and that's something we'll talk a little bit about in part two of the course. Unit testing for effectful functions, and for that matter, any kind of testing with effectful functions is much harder. Um, it requires just a great deal more complexity to make it work out. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're starting the course out using non-effectful functions or using what's called functional programming, because it's much easier to do the testing. Uh, but you can still, in the first part of the course, get used to the ideas of rigorous testing and, and driving your development by tests and learn a whole lot about that kind of testing. So that then it's an easier step to test effectful functions later. So that's what I want to say about that. Mm 
I'm going mostly through the, I'm being driven largely by the, um, What's the question? Yeah, but what's the question? I know what my question is. What's the question? Um, okay. Let me talk a little bit now about, I'm going to, again, try to sort of blend together three or four questions um, uh, that we've seen. One having to do with the Cartesian question, one having to do with writing, with how you write the expected value part of a check expect. So let's just suppose that, um, I want to see if I can do this without actually doing Cartesian, but maybe I'll do Cartesian. Design a function that consumes two arguments, the base legs of a triangle and produces a hypotenuse. I always forget how to spell this word. Tina's going to look it up for me. Where? Oh, yeah. Tina's still going to look it up. Okay. So look, the function consumes two numbers. And it produces a number. Right? You had it right. I had it right. Dina got it wrong. It was Dina who got it wrong. Um, produce side C from I'll do a stub. The stub for a function that produces a number, I make it produce zero. I'll label it the stub. Now we're really going to work on the check expects. We're mostly going to work on the check expects. So check expect, the first part of the check expect is always very easy because the first part of the check expect is open paren check expect, open paren the name of the function. Don't have to do anything else. Now I need two numbers. Okay. Now, you know, I might have drawn a little picture off to the side here to think about what some interesting numbers might be. You know, I could use 0 and 0. They're not going to be so interesting because the result's going to be 0, but I'll put 0. I could happen to remember that there's a thing called a 3, 4, 5 triangle, and put 3, 4, and 5. Let's just do that for a second, and then let's jump to the template. The template for a function like this is dot, 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 a, b. Both of the number parameters get included. I'll copy the template, comment out both the stub and the template. Now, at this point, you know, I might not know quite what to do. And I might put five. And I'll quickly find out that five is not enough because the first test is failing. It's almost always a good idea to have two tests, just to make sure that you can't make this mistake, which is to make the body of the function be the right answer for one of the tests. So it's not five, so let's back up a little bit. What is it? Hmm. Now here's what I do sometimes here, which is I go make the expected result in the check expect be more clear as to why that's the result. Why is it 5? 
And the reason it's five is because I, I took, you know, I'm going to say, why is it five? Or sometimes what I'll do is I'll leave this test and I'll make a second one that's also going to be five, but it's going to say why. And the reason it's five is that I squared three and I squared four and I added those together and I took the square root of all that. This template's not running because it's, it's, it's a template. Templates get run. But now let's look at this. Oh, well, that looks better. Good. Now I've got it. Now I understand what I'm doing. Let me take this thing. This is much better. And I'll put that in here. Well, that's no good either because that first test is still failing because this is still just producing five. The next step you have to make is to realize, oh, this isn't really three. This is A. This is what three is, and this is what A is in this example. And this is what B is in this example. So really what I need to do is phrase the body of the function in terms of A and B. Oops, sorry. I need to not do that. I need to do that. I need to phrase the body of the function in terms of A and B. Okay? And the reason I sometimes write the example out this way is to get me half the distance between there and there. It can sometimes be hard to go all the way from, well, the results in this case is 5, to that. If you go to the intermediate step of, well, if I write the expression in terms of these particular parameters, then in the next step, I can kind of replace those values. If I write this expression in terms of these particular values, these particular arguments, then I can go down here and replace the values with the parameter name. So that's why we have this practice of sometimes putting the actual expression here rather than just the value. Is it the way of figuring out for yourself what well, did I get to the value? Not just what is the value, but how did I get to the value? Because that's what you need to have by the time you finish the function. Is in general, the rules for getting to the value. So this is the value. This is a particular example of how to get it. And this is the general rule for how to compute the value. And this interim is sometimes a very helpful interim step. Uh, okay. So I've got another question, which is why slash when will check expects get difficult? Um, and you know, this is kind of the weekly question. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of people in the class think that the check expects already are difficult. That's why I spent so much time on this, which is that learning how to write this interim form of check expect I think for a lot of people learning how to write this interim form of check expect is difficult. Um, and, and so we're kind of proceeding at a pace for beginners. Um, that said, I would expect that even for people who are in the program, oh, 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 o
exactly, if you already have some programming experience, I can't tell you exactly when the check expects to get this result. But I bet they will. Um, uh, just thinking carefully about tests, if you haven't been doing it, um, take some time to let me Let me tell the beginners a story that will make you happy. Our experience at UBC is that on average, people who've already programmed get an average grade in the class. Because at the beginning, they say, ah, oh, this is too easy, this is too easy, this is too easy, and then they don't learn the rest of it. And then we get to some very hard problems at the end, which the people who kind of learn the recipe from the beginning are the easy to it. So, you know, it's a little bit of a tortoise and hare thing. Um, that's what we see on average. It's not always true that some people who come in on the program who do spectacularly well, but the people who sort of take the time to absorb the recipe in the early going tend to use the recipe better when they get to the end. I think I have time for just one more question. And I'm looking at Dina for that one more question. Oh, here's one more question. I guess it's a follow up on what I was saying about whether this is the whole course. Uh, what parts of the course are we missing and how do you get um, um, Parts of the parts of our course that we're not doing this time out aren't on video yet. Um, if they were if they were on video, we'd already have part two of the class. We have to get them to video. Um, the reason that is this whole this whole part one isn't on video. As soon as this is done, I'm going back to working on the second half of week six. Um, so there really isn't another source for if you want to take this whole course, you know. Uh, um, there are some other courses that use this method, um, not that are moot, not quite as uh, rigorously as we do, I think, uh, but they do use it, and there's some discussion about that in the threads. So, you know, there's lots of other material out there, and then of course there's the book. Um, uh, and we will we'll have more of the course on video uh, in the fall, certainly. Oh, hang on, just one last question. On Yahoo, Google, YouTube. Oh god, the audio has been terrible this last minute. Ah. We're going to get this audio thing right before the end of the course. Um, hopefully, we're going to get it right next week. What I was just saying is uh, just two things quickly. I don't know how much of it you did or didn't hear. One had to do with when our check expects going to get difficult, and what I was just saying is, you know, for the majority of the class, I think the check expects already are difficult, and we're pacing the course at that pace. Um, for those people, uh, a good good bit of news is that what we observe at UBC is that um, uh, the people who start the course as beginners, on average, get the same average grade as the people who start the course already know how to program because learning the recipe well at the beginning really does make a difference at the end. That was the one thing I said. Ah. So, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll just close with, again, with you know the suggestion to practice, with the suggestion that when you have errors in your code, you look at the error message, you look at what's highlighted, and use that to help you figure out what's going on. With the suggestion that when you post messages, you, questions, you be as specific as you can possibly be. Um, with the suggestion that you feel free to practice, try some experiments, cobble together some stuff to see if you can get the primitives to work the way you want them to work. Um, and I'll repeat the suggestion of practice. And if it is getting a little bit difficult for you now, uh, or even week one was difficult, I wouldn't worry about that too much. For people who just come into this, it takes some time to kind of get the notion of what programming is uh, under your belt. Um, we observe when we teach the class at UBC that for a lot of people, it starts to go better along about week three. 
uh, keep asking questions, and we'll be posting uh, week three material for those of you who are chomping to get that. Um, right now, that's all scheduled to go out at, uh, in two hours, and we'll see if we actually hit that schedule, but we'll certainly be very close to it. Good luck with finishing up week two and the quizzes, and we'll see you in week three.